We are very honored to have Dr. Peter Kuznick, a professor of history at uh, American University, uh, on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Today's, uh, today's, today's program is going to uh, proceed as follows. Um, I will give some brief, brief remarks on uh, Asia, uh, atomic bomb literature. Then Professor Terazawa will uh, give uh, some uh, brief remarks from the perspective of her family. And then we will move to the main event, uh, Dr. Kuznick's talk. Um, so uh, since time is short, I actually want to move right uh, to my uh, brief remarks. Um, uh, I am Patricia Welch. I'm, the, I'm a professor of Asian Studies and the director of the Asian Studies program here at Hofstra. OK, so on August 6, 1945, at about 8.15 AM, an atomic bomb was detonated about 1,000 feet above central Hiroshima. The bomb generated a searing fireball and a series of shock waves, which killed almost 100% of the people in the immediate vicinity and destroyed all of the buildings. Fires then swept the city, trapping many people who had survived the immediate impact. In the weeks, months, and years that followed, radiation sickness killed thousands more. It even killed people who weren't in Hiroshima at the time of the bombing, but who had returned to the city to help victims and assess damage. While the total death toll has been the subject of debate and politics, there is widespread agreement that the atomic bombing of Hiroshima killed about half the population by January of 1946 and many thousands more over the next few years. On August 9, 1945, three days later, another atomic bomb was detonated, this time over Nagasaki on the western island of Kyushu. Although the bomb itself was as potentially destructive as the one which hit Hiroshima, it caused somewhat less death and destruction, in part because of the geography of Nagasaki and in part because of some mistakes in aiming at the target. Even so, about a quarter of the population of Nagasaki is dead by the years and tens of thousands more by 1950. Thus, in both cases, the bombings destroyed the physical city and the social fabric. One day after the bombing of Nagasaki, on August 10, 1945, the Japanese government surrendered. My brief remarks today will not touch on the actual bombing apart from the summary above, or even the politics, but will focus on something different, the practice and process of making sense of the bombing through the act of writing, both in the immediate aftermath of the bombs up until the present day. The atomic bombs gave rise to a new literature, Genbaku Bungaku, one which attempted to give voice to the voiceless and memorialize the previously unimaginable, namely, quote, the memory of a likely future in which all human experience concludes. This is a quote from John Treat. Although survivors, both direct and indirect, uh, rather, through survivors, direct and indirect, A-bomb literature reveals humanity in a compromised state between life and death and no longer comfortable in the modernist equation the technological developments are uniformly good. In Notes on Literature, the poet Theodore Adorno wrote on the difficulty of writing after Auschwitz. Trauma is a site that does not exist. No road leads there. No path leads around it. Trauma is inaccessible. Access through words seems to be blocked. How on earth can one speak about something that is impossible to express? What words could one use for a horror that is beyond the possibilities of language? How to speak about something that cannot be spoken of, yet the abundance of real suffering permits no forgetting. Despite this, writers have attempted to memorialize both the Holocaust and the atomic bombings in order to memorialize it and make sense of it both for themselves and for those that followed, so as to give purpose to the meaningless deaths. Atomic bomb literature can be divided into different groups, which roughly correspond to whether or not the writer directly witnessed the event and why they are compelled to write. The first generation features the writings of adult individuals who were there when the bombs exploded. Their works typically focus on the actual event and the difficulty of conveying the impossible. Writers in this generation include Harata Miki, Hachiya Michihiko, Toge Sankichi, Agawa Hiroyuki, and Ota Yoko, 
whose early account of the bombing was published in the Asahi Shimbun in the brief space between Japan's defeat and the reimposition of censorship, this time under the American occupation. Writers of the second generation were typically children who are writing retrospectively about the horror they witnessed as they attempt to make sense of it. Writers in this group include Hayashi Kyoko and Obamineko. The third group aren't direct witnesses to the event, but work with the documentary and historical record as they craft their works. This generation includes such writers as Ibuse Masuji, whose powerful novel, Black Rain, tells two overlapping stories, the experience of the bomb in, the, in its immediate aftermath and its effect on a single family some five years later when their marriageable age niece becomes ill with radiation sickness. Writers in this bombing, uh, I'm sorry, writers in this generation see bombing as having deleterious effects, not just for the individuals directly affected, but for society as a whole. The fourth generation or group of writers are non-witnesses who use the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki to set a stage to show how these events have shaped the psyche of the world, how we now live with the possibility of our total annihilation at our own hands. You might say that the works in this last generation belong to the larger genre of nuclear literature. Works in this group include novels by Murakami Ryu and even contemporary anime like In This Corner of the World. Even Godzilla 1954 can be seen to stem from an attempt to make sense of the unimaginable. As readers, atomic bomb literature allows us in our even more imperfect way to act as witnesses to the lives of those who are lost and empathize with their suffering, even as we examine ourselves and our place in the world. Through literature, their lives live on and through literature, we can perhaps create a different, more positive future, though in full knowledge of our immense destructive power. Thank you. And now I would like to uh, turn the, 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 the Zoom over to Professor Terazawa of the History Department. Um, I am Professor Yuki Terazawa from the History Department. I'd like to give an introductory remark as somebody who was born and then brought up in Nagasaki. I want to share my uh, family history from my father's side and um, in terms of their experience with war and in bombing. My father's family, including my grandmother, my father and then his two stepsisters, and then my grandfather having already been dead um, due to some you know, illness. Uh, so my grandma was um, keeping, um, well, you know, they were living in the city of, city of Nagasaki and then she was keeping fish market, which um, my deceased um, grandfather had been um, running um, before his death, uh, and um, so in sp so in sp in the spring of 1945, this was four months before the atomic bomb was dropped in Nagasaki. She was told that um, the land on which her fish market stood was needed for a military purpose. So she had, you know, she didn't have any choice but to shut down her business and then, uh, and then move to the countryside, um, to, to uh, the hometown of my um, grandfather. So, and then this is how they didn't become the victims of, um, you know, atomic, you know, atomic bomb. Um, so so my, my mother, you know, my, my grandmother on the on mother's side actually was in the city of Nagasaki when the bomb was dropped, but I have to skip that, that story maybe later. Um, so anyway, so as somebody who uh, received K-12 education in Nagasaki, I, along with other children, read numerous stories of atomic bomb survivors as a child. It was somewhat of a shock to me uh, that, that Japanese people from other areas than Hiroshima and Nagasaki were not taught much about the atomic bombing when I, you know, when I discovered that. Uh, then I moved to the United States, started to teach, and then my, many of my students, American students, have been telling me that they, they even didn't have um, the chance to see any photos of bombed cities or um, atomic bomb survivors. I'm a historian, and, and I've had the chance, I mean, I, you know, I had the experience of, of teaching European Holocaust, and I know uh, the seriousness 
of its atrocities. And, and I'm in agreement that we should teach um, the horror of European Holocaust more and then not less. But having said that, I believe it is legitimate to, to say we should make more efforts to teach World War, World War II experience in Asia and the Pacific, including uh, this, this issue of atomic bombing. From the 1990s, um, historians in East Asia have done new research on atrocities committed by the Japanese army in China and in Southeast Asia, including the well-known issue of the so-called comfort women, namely sex slaves of the Japanese army. In order to do justice to Asian victims of World War II, perhaps both topics, the victims of the ethnic bombing and an Asian victims of the atrocities committed by the Japanese army, um, you know, both topics should be taught more widely um, in the United States or globally. Uh, on this note, I'd like to introduce today's guest speaker, Professor Peter Kuznick. He is a historian and then he published a book entitled Beyond the Laboratory, Scientists as Political Activists in the 1930s America. He co-edited co important books on the issue of nuclear weapons and a nuclear power involving Japan and the United States. He established the Nuclear Studies Institute at American University, which he currently supervises as its director. So please welcome Professor Kuznick. Now it's his turn to speak. Thank you, Professor Terizawa and Professor Welch. <clears throat> um, let me first say that uh, as part of my Nuclear Studies Institute, I've been taking students on a study abroad class to Hiroshima and Nagasaki every summer since 1995, except for this past summer, which we had to skip because of the pandemic. But we're gonna be doing it again next summer. And we open it up to students from every university. So if anybody's interested, I hope you'll join us. It's an incredible experience we can talk about later. But today, this is a topic which my students, my current class this semester on American, American culture in the nuclear age have already sat through 15 hours on the subject that I'm gonna to try to boil down to about the next 25 or 30 minutes. So um, I'm gonna leave out a lot of essential things that you should raise if you've got questions about in the discussion period afterwards. So a lot of the evidence that I'd like to give to make the case that I'm gonna present I'll have to be doing it very, in a shorthand fashion. And I want to start with a 2019 New York Times op-ed by former National Security Advisor, Susan Rice. And she wrote, following D-Day, my father was sent to the West Coast to prepare for deployment to the Pacific Theater. He was spared combat by President Harry Truman's decision to drop atomic weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, provoking the Japanese surrender. In writing this, Susan Rice was either consciously or unconsciously perpetuating a lie that has been at the heart of American triumphalism for 75 years. Rice should have known better. She attended Stanford University uh, and then later went on to get uh, MPhil and DPhil degrees in international relations at Oxford. At Stanford, she was a history major, but perhaps her judgment was clouded by the fact that she was a Harry S. Truman scholar at Stanford, but there's still no excuse because one of the leading scholars on nuclear history, Bart Bernstein, is a prominent member of the faculty at Stanford. Uh, so, but after that, she still had three more, several more decades to discover the truth before May, 9, May 2016, when she accompanied President Barack Obama to Hiroshima. Uh, Obama, uh, she joined him in visiting the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Museum, uh, that Obama visited the site of the first atomic bombing while he was in office something that none of his 11 predecessors had the decency or courage to do, 
was an important symbolic gesture. I had been urging him to do so from the day he got elected. And I was very glad to see that. And Obama's abhorrence of nuclear weapons was probably sincere. He marched in the big march in Central Park in New York with a million people in 1982 against nuclear weapons. He won the Nobel Peace Prize for his 20, uh, 2009 speech in Prague calling for nuclear abolition, at least of a sort. Uh, Rice was involved in preparing Obama for the trip to Hiroshima, and she helped do damage control for the always cautious president. She met beforehand with a delegation of veterans at the White House, and she assured them that there would be no apologies made for the atomic bombing by Obama while he was in Hiroshima. She doubled down on this assurance when discussing the impending visit on CNN. Host Fareed Zakaria noted that Rice's deputy, Ben Rhodes, had said that Obama wouldn't be revisiting the decision to drop the atomic bombs and commented, Zakaria says, I wonder why not? It seems like that is the elephant in the room. Why not discuss it? You know, discuss, you know what the president thinks about it. Surely the Japanese must be wondering. Then Zakaria asked Rice point blank what she, whether she thought the atomic bombing was justified. And she responded, I'm not gonna give you my historian's judgment on the decision. Why, why not, he asked. She punted a second time. This will be a forward-looking visit. Yes, it'll happen in the context of history, but we don't think it's particularly useful to give a long discourse on the past. This is about the future. Frustrated by her refusal, Zakaria pressed one more time, quote, and the president must have a view on whether it was correct decision to drop the atomic bomb. He's a man who studies history deeply. Surely he has a view. I'm not saying that he doesn't, she replied. End of conversation. For any left waiting for her answer, for her to divulge her historian's judgment, the New York Times piece should have provided the answer. But this same myth or lie, as I call it, uh, is also evident in the recent New York Times best-selling book, number one bestseller by Chris Wallace called Countdown 1945. You all remember Wallace from trying to moderate that first insane debate between Trump and Biden. Uh, he's the Fox News commentator. And in his book, Wallace writes, despite all his misgivings, Truman knew he had to drop the atomic bomb. The Manhattan Project had given him a weapon to potentially end the war. And no matter how devastating their losses, the Japanese refused to surrender. They left him no choice. So the unanimous judgment of our experts here. So although Obama deserves credit, for having visited Hiroshima, his performance left much to be desired and the long run may have done more harm than good. He actually spent significantly more time talking to the US and Japanese troops at the Iwakuni US Marine Base than he did at the museum or peace park in Hiroshima. His speech in front of the cenotaph began on a thoroughly dishonest note when he said, quote, 71 years ago, on a bright cloudless morning, death fell from the sky and the world was changed. Obviously death didn't fall from the sky. The United States dropped two atomic bombs. Uh, and uh, this, the, by deceitfully deploying passive voice, something that I'm sure all your professors tell you never to do, uh, he masked US responsibility. He refused to even directly acknowledge his country's culpability for dropping atomic bombs. While no one expected an apology, many did expect a more honest account of what occurred. What was the most disturbing about his brief speech was his deliberate perpetuation of this fundamental lie about the bombing when he said World War II reached this brutal end in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Obama's visit, which was a major boost to bellicose, history-denying Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in his re-election bid that was forthcoming, uh, did help focus public attention on the bombings. But Obama perpetuated the myth that because the atomic bombs ended the Pacific War without a U.S. invasion, thereby saving 
possibly half a million American lives and maybe millions of Japanese and other Asian lives, that dropping the atomic bombs was actually a justifiable and even a benevolent act. He regretted the slaughter of hundreds of thousands of Japanese civilians, as did all, as all decent people do, but he accepted that the victims were collateral damage sacrificed for the greater good. This rewriting of history is extraordinarily dangerous. It makes possible the belief in American exceptionalism, which rests upon the notion of an intrinsic decency and generosity that motivates US actions around the world. This notion of American exceptionalism, the idea that the United States is not only different from all other countries, that the United States is better than all other countries, that where other countries are motivated by desire for territorial gain or geopolitical gain or material gain, the US is motivated by trying, wanting to spread freedom and democracy around the world. Uh, and this notion is the bedrock upon which the American empire was created. It makes tolerable the buildup of a nuclear arsenal that threatens to extinguish life on the planet and it makes tolerable the unending series of wars that the US has fought to ensure its hegemony. The truth is, and I'll try to explain to you, that the atomic bombs were not necessary to end World War II without a US invasion. Uh, that an American leaders, starting with Truman, knew that that was the case. They were fully aware of it. And in fact, in fact, Japanese leaders had understood since the defeat in the Battle of Saipan in July of 1944, that military defeat was not possible. As early as February 1945, Prince Kanoe, the three-time former Japanese prime minister, wrote a memo to Emperor Hirohito in which he says, I regret to say that Japan's defeat is inevitable. That was February of 1945. Kanoe wrote to the emperor, I regret to say that Japan's defeat is inevitable. In May, Japanese leaders formally decided to approach the Soviet Union to help them get better surrender terms from the United States and Britain. And they especially objected to the demand for unconditional surrender. To them, unconditional surrender meant that the Americans and the British would try the emperor as a war criminal and he would likely be executed. The emperor to the Japanese was a kind of deity. They trace the lineage back to 660 BC. General Douglas MacArthur's Southwest Pacific Command issued a background briefing the summer of 1945 in which they said, execution of the emperor to them would be comparable to the crucifixion of Christ to us. All would fight to die like ants. Almost all of Truman's close advisors urged him to change the surrender terms, let the Japanese know that they could keep the emperor. The only one who opposed that on a high level was, uh, was Jimmy Burns. Burns was Truman's main advisor from the day he, he came to office. And it was Burns who Truman appointed as Secretary of State on July 3rd. And Burns told him that if you let them keep the emperor, you're gonna be politically crucified. All the others led by Secretary of War Stimson and Acting Secretary of State before Burns, Joseph Gru, who was really the expert on Japan, urged him to change the surrender terms. So that was the first way that the Americans could end the war but, uh, without using atomic bombs and without an invasion. The Americans understood that Japan desperation weeks, if not months, before the US dropped the atomic bombs. The US had broken the Japanese codes and were intercepting their cables, and especially the cable traffic that went from uh, Ambassador, Foreign Minister Togo in Tokyo to Ambassador Sato in Moscow, went back and forth. And what those cables said were on July 12th cable, the un unconditional surrender is the only 
obstacle to ending the war. Back and forth, it's the emperor's heart's desire to end this war and stop the suffering, but we can't do so as long as the Americans and the British demand unconditional surrender. What did Truman understand? Well, Truman refers to the intercepted July 12th cable as the, the telegram from the Jap emperor asking for peace. Those are Truman's words. The telegram from the Jap emperor asking for peace. Uh, the American leaders knew that there was also a second factor that was coming to play, play that could end the war without the atomic bombs and without an invasion. They could wait for the Soviet Union to enter the war. The United States had been imploring the Soviets to come into the Pacific War from the day after Pearl Harbor. But the Soviets had their own war to fight against Germany. And so it wasn't until Yalta in February 1945 that Stalin finally agreed to uh, Roosevelt's urging them to come into the war. And Stalin said, we'll come into the Pacific War three months after the end of the war in Europe. That would put the date right around August 8th. Uh, the American intelligence had been saying that once the Soviets come into the war, the war is over. On April 11th, 45, the Joint Intelligence Staff of the Joint Chiefs of Staff predicted, quote, if at any time the USSR should enter the war, all Japanese will realize that absolute defeat is inevitable. That's the intelligence reports. It came up over and over again, intelligence reporting that that was the situation that the, would happen if the Japanese, uh, if the Soviets entered the war. Little more than a month later, Japan's Supreme War Council drew a similar conclusion. They reported, quote, at the present moment, when Japan is waging a life or death struggle against the US and Britain, Soviet entry into the war will deal a death blow to the Japanese empire. The Pacific Strategic Intelligence Summary of the US for the week of the Potsdam meeting says, it may be said that Japan now officially, if not publicly, recognizes her defeat. Abandoning as unobtainable the long cherished goal of victory, she has turned to the twin aims of A, reconciling national pride with defeat, and B, finding the best means of salvaging the wreckage of her ambitions. So the Japanese were saying this, the Americans were saying this, and the Soviets understood this because the Japanese had been meeting with Soviets in order to try to get, help them get better surrender terms. In fact, the, in Tokyo, the uh, former Japanese Prime Minister Koki Hirota met several times with the, Jap with the Soviet ambassador, Jacob Malik. Malik wrote back to the Kremlin that the Japanese are desperate to surrender. This was in early June, the Soviets understood that, that the Japanese were desperate to surrender. Uh, so, but what does Truman understand? Truman says, Truman goes to Potsdam and he has lunch with Stalin on July 17th. After the lunch, Truman writes in his diary, Stalin will be in the Jap war by August 15th. Finny Japs when that occurs. Finny Japs when the Soviets come in. He writes home to his wife, Bess, the next day, says the Russians are coming in, will end the war a year sooner now. Think of all the kids who won't be killed. So um, the Japanese leaders, the atomic bombings, horrible as they were, did not change the strategic equation. The Soviet invasion, which began at midnight on August 8th, did. The Red Army is expected, blitzed through, destroyed Japan's once mighty Kwantung army in Manchuria. As the Japanese feared, Soviet entry ended all reason for delaying surrender. When Prime Minister Suzuki was asked on August 13th, why Japan had to surrender so quickly, he responded, Japan must surrender or the Soviet Union will take not only Manchuria, Korea, Karafuto, but also Hokkaido. Uh, 
This will destroy the foundation of Japan. We must end the war when we can deal with the United States. The reason is that the Americans have been firebombing Japanese cities since the night of March 9th and 10th when we firebombed Tokyo. The US had firebombed more than 100 Japanese cities. The destruction reached 99.5% in the city of Toyama. Oliver Stone, my co-author in the Untold History of the United States, and I visited Toyama at the invitation of the city government two summers ago, uh, because we write about this in the Untold History and show it in our documentaries. And so we met with some of the survivors of the firebombing. They actually that week opened up a new museum for the firebombing there, but 99.5% of the city of Toyama. So the Japanese knew that the US could wipe out their cities. To them, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, horrible as they were, were simply two more cities that they were willing to sacrifice. But the Soviet invasion changed the equation and made it clear to them that further resistance holding out any longer was pointless, meaningless, and futile. Post-war American myth makers have clung to the idea that the bombs made it possible to avoid the invasion. The number of American lives saved kept climbing. Initially, President Truman and General Groves said it saved thousands of lives. Then in the first drafts of Truman's memoirs, he said it saved a quarter of a million lives. In his memoir that was published in 1955, he says General Marshall told me it would save half a million lives. The highest actual estimate we've ever been able to find of Marshall's was if there was an invasion, we could lose 46,000. American troops, but Truman clung to this idea. Later in life, Truman said it saved a million uh, American lives. Sometimes they added Japanese lives. President George H.W. Bush praised Truman's tough calculating decision that saved millions of American lives. But few prior to Gar Alperovitz in his 1965 book, Atomic Diplomacy, dared acknowledge that the real target of the bombs was not only the Japan, it was also the Soviet Union. Within 11 days of taking office, President Truman had reversed Roosevelt's friendly policies toward the Soviets and was now accusing them in his meeting with Foreign Minister Molotov of having broken the Yalta agreements. Uh, it, uh, we can go into the history of that. Rusty is a, Professor Eisenberg is a great expert on all of this too. Uh, so in any way, the atomic bombings were a ruthless warning to the Soviets who knew better than anybody how desperate the Japanese were to surrender, that if the Soviets interfered with American plans in Europe or the Pacific, they were going to get this and worse and much, much worse. As Brigadier General Leslie Groves, who directed the Manhattan Project, admitted, he said, quote, there was never from about two weeks from the time I took charge of this project, any illusion on my part that Russia was our enemy and the project was conducted on that basis. Uh, he said to Joseph Rotblat, the future Nobel Peace Prize winner, uh, uh, over dinner in 1944, he said, uh, you, are real, you realize, of course, that the main purpose of this project is to subdue the Russians. Jimmy Burns, Truman's closest advisor, met with Leo Zollard, Harold Walter Bartke, Harold Bart, Walter Bartke and Harold Urey in South Carolina in the end of May of 1945 and said the same thing to, to Zollard, who was horrified at the thought we we're going to use the weapons. And, Stims, and Burns says to him, well, you're Hungarian, aren't you? Don't you want to see us drive the Soviets out of Hungary and the rest of Eastern Europe? The bomb is what we need to do that. Well, they all understood this. And we're lucky to have survived up to this point. The truth, however, would occasionally break through this dense cloud of falsehood surrounding the atomic bombings and the Japanese surrender. The official US Navy Museum in Washington, DC, in its display on the end of the war, now states clearly, says, quote, the vast destruction 
wreaked by the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the loss of 135,000 people made little impact on the Japanese military. However, the Soviet invasion of Manchuria on August 9th changed their minds. The War Department special report at January of 1946 on the end of the war says exactly the same thing. I could read it to you, but in the Japanese cabinet meetings, there was no discussion of the atomic bombings. All the discussion was of the Soviet invasion. In fact, few Americans know that the United States had eight five-star admirals and generals in 1945. Seven of the eight are on the record saying that the atomic bombings were either militarily unnecessary, morally reprehensible, or both. The clearest statement was by Admiral William Leahy. Leahy was Truman's personal chief of staff. He chaired the meetings of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and Leahy proclaimed, quote, the Japanese were already defeated and ready to surrender. The use of this barbarous weapon at Hiroshima and Nagasaki was of no material assistance in our war against Japan. And being the first to use it, we adopted an ethical standard common to the barbarians of the Dark Ages. That was Admiral Leahy. General Eisenhower met with Secretary of War Stimson at Potsdam and Eisenhower said, he told me we were about to use it. And, and I didn't say anything because my war in Europe was already over. Then he asked me what I thought about it. So I told him I was against it on two counts. First, the Japanese were ready to surrender and it wasn't necessary to hit them with that awful thing. Second, I hated to be, see our country be the first to use such a weapon. General Douglas MacArthur, hardly a pacifist. MacArthur was itching to use atomic bombs in the Korean War. MacArthur was vehemently opposed to the use of atomic bombs in World War II. He wrote in a memo later to former President Hoover, he said that if Truman had followed your advice and changed the surrender terms, the Japanese would have surrendered as early as May perhaps and been happy to do so. We could have ended the war months earlier and saved not only American lives, but Japanese lives, Chinese lives and all. And that was uh, that was MacArthur. Uh, Eisenhower, well, we don't have time, but if we want to, we could talk about what Eisenhower represented in terms of the buildup of nuclear arms. It was under Eisenhower, um, when Eisenhower became president, the U.S. had about a thousand nuclear weapons. When he left office, the U.S. had more than 22,000 nuclear weapons. When, I, when his budgeting cycle was finished, we had 30,000 nuclear weapons, but even he was horrified throughout his career about the use of nuclear weapons. Under Eisenhower, we went from one finger on the nuclear button to dozens of fingers. If we have time, we can go into Eisenhower. But the obfuscation provided by Rice, Obama, and others uh, pales in comparison to the crass vulgarity regarding the atomic bombings on the part of Trump and some of his low-life associates. A case in point that always strike, stands out to me is the endorsement Trump received from former basketball player and University of Indiana coach Bobby Knight, who compared Trump to Truman. And, and in endorsing him at the University of Indiana, uh, Knight said, I'll tell you who sa they said wasn't presidential. This is back in 2016. So I'll tell you who they said wasn't presidential, Harry Truman. And Harry Truman, with what he did in dropping and having the guts to drop the bomb in 1944, uh, saved millions of American lives. And that's what Harry Truman did. And he became one of the three great presidents of the United States. And here's a man, Donald Trump, who would do the same thing because he's going to become one of the four great presidents of the United States. Trump was overcome with emotion. And he got, considered this a compliment and he gushed, such a great guy. Wow, how do you top that? You should be very proud of him in Indiana. This man is a national treasure, okay? Now we can get into Trump's nuclear policies if we have a chance. Uh, but whether it's the obscene triumphalism of boorish Bobby Knight and by implication Donald Trump or the more restrained perpetuation of myths by Barack Obama and Susan Rice, U.S. politicians' attitudes 
about the U.S. atomic bombings have helped legitimize the ongoing potentially omnicidal U.S. nuclear policy. And in fact, Truman was well aware of this threat, as he said on at least three occasions. And <clears throat> it's so important that I'm going to mention them. Uh, Tr Truman writes in his memoir that he got his first real briefing on the atomic bombings, his first day in office from Jimmy Burns. And he says, Burns told me that this was a weapon great enough to destroy the whole world. Truman got a fuller briefing on the bomb on April 25th from General Groves and Secretary of War Stimson. And they told him that within four months, we're gonna have a weapon, one of which can destroy an entire city. And Truman said afterwards, Simpson said gravely that he didn't know whether we could or should use the bomb because he was afraid it was so powerful it could end up destroying the whole world. I felt the same fear as he and Groves continued to talk about it. And when I read Groves' 24 page report, it was at Potsdam that Truman got the full report on how devastating the bomb test at Almogordo was. And he writes in his journal, he says, we discovered the most terrible bomb in history. This may be the fire destruction prophesied in the Euphrates Valley era after Noah and his fabulous ark. Not a bigger bomb, not a more powerful bomb, but the fire destruction in the, in the Euphrates Valley era. What Truman understood is he was beginning a process that could end all life on earth and yet he went ahead and used it in the most reckless way that he was warned was likely to trigger the nuclear arms race that we've been living with ever since. And when he heard that the city of Hiroshima was wiped off the map, he was on board the USS Augusta back to the US and he jumped up and he said, this is the greatest thing in history. So, but this has led to the threat that we face now. And it's not just Trump, the boorish Trump, it's also Obama who began the 30-year, $1.2 trillion modernization program of America's entire nuclear arsenal in order to make it more efficient and more lethal. And it's uh, now $1.7 trillion, according to the latest estimate. Uh, and we could go into some of his history, but the reality now, as I think a lot of you know, is that according to the experts, we're closer to nuclear annihilation now than we've ever been, at least since the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. The Bulletin Atomic Scientist began its doomsday clock in 1947. The closest they ever put it to doomsday nuclear annihilation was after 1953, after the US and the Soviets tested the hydrogen bombs, they moved the hands of the doomsday clock to two minutes before midnight. It got back there in January of 2018 but last year they moved the hands of the doomsday clock to 100 seconds before midnight, closer than we've ever been. And I think now it should be even closer than that. But fortunately, much of the world has not been fooled by US deceptions surrounding the atomic bombings. In November of 2019, Pope Francis made the first papal visit to Hiroshima and Nagasaki since that of Pope Paul VI in 1982. And he spoke with the kind of honesty that Obama dared not. In Nagasaki, he deplored attempts to build upon the future of mutual destruction or the threat of total annihilation. He said in this city, given what it witnessed, our attempts to speak out against the arms race will never be enough. He condemned those who would sanction or profit from this orgy of potential destruction. In Hiroshima, after listening to two moving Hibakusha testimony, the Pope reflected on what had occurred. And he said, here in an incandescent burst of lightning and fire, so many men and women, so many dreams and hopes disappeared, leaving behind only shadows and silence. In barely an instant, everything was devoured by a black hole of destruction and death. From that abyss of silence, we continue even today to hear the cries of those who are no longer that the use of atomic energy for the purposes of war is immoral. So too the possession of nuclear weapons is immoral. As I said two years ago, we cannot allow present and future generations to lose the memory 
of what happened here. The Pope's message, while poignant and stirring, cannot compare in raw emotional intensity to remarks made on August 6, 2009, at the Hiroshima Peace Memorial Ceremony by Nicaraguan priest Miguel Descoto Brockman, who at the time was president of the United Nations General Assembly. And he, he remembered what he called one of the greatest atrocities the world has ever witnessed. He says, quote, as a Roman Catholic priest and as a disciple of Jesus of Nazareth, I, went, I want also from the depth of my heart to seek forgiveness from all my brothers and sisters in Japan for the fact that the captain of the fateful B-29 Enola Gay, Paul Tibbetts, now deceased, was a member of my church. I am consoled to a certain degree that Father George Zabelka, the Catholic chaplain of the mission, recognized after the event that this is one of the worst imaginable betrayals of the teachings of Jesus. In the name of my church, this Goto uh, Brockman implored listeners, I ask your forgiveness. Actually, Father Zabelka not only apologized, he actually returned to Hiroshima, threw himself face down on the tarmac, wept and uh, begged forgiveness, uh, as Harry Truman should have done. So combating these official lies, this triumphal narrative about the necessary and justifiable and humane atomic obliteration of Hiroshima and Nagasaki has at times seemed like a Sisyphean effort. Most polls taken between 1945 and 2015 showed a sizable majority of Americans supporting the atomic bombings. As late as 2015, a Pew poll found that 56% thought the atomic bombings were justified and only 34% not. This may have been an improvement over the 85% who told Gallup pollsters in, 19, in uh, August of 1945 that they approved of the dropping the atomic bombs. Uh, the 60, actually 22.7% of Americans said in November of 1945 that they wished the Japanese had not surrendered so quickly so we could have dropped more atomic bombs on them. 30% of Southwestern Americans said they wish we could have dropped more atomic bombs on the Japanese. Uh, but among, it's interesting, among Japanese in 2015, only 14% thought the atomic bombings were justified, while 79% thought not. This poll, how there was a poll in May of 2016 by CBS News which for the first time, the only time, showed a plurality of Americans actually disapproving the atomic bombing. 44% of Americans in that poll said that they, it was wrong for the United States to drop the atomic bombs. Only 43% said they approved. That was May of 2016, the only time. So although the Pope's visit received much more prominent coverage internationally than it did in the US, Perhaps his condemnation may have tipped the balance further uh, in favor of those who contemn the atomic bombings and the nuclear badness that they ushered in. But with the hands of the doomsday clock at 100 seconds before midnight, we can only hope for some belated infusion of sanity before it's too late to look back and regret that we didn't act when we had the chance. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Kuznick. Um, Rusty, will you be uh, monitoring the chat for the questions or how are we uh, responding or? Oh, Rusty, you're on mute. Um, okay, all right. Um, so are we asking students to put their questions in, ch in chat? Is that how we're? Well, we have, a number, we have a number in chat right now. We can go through some of them and then we can ask students to raise their hand if they have additional questions. Okay. Using the raise hand function. Do you want to start, Pat, because I don't have mine quite up. Oh, certainly. Okay. Uh, let me see. Hold on a second. Um, okay. So, uh, 
uh, one question is uh, is actually uh, uh, why did Truman refuse so vehemently to simply change the surrender terms? Was this a result of American pride and triumphalism? Well, I think the simple answer is two things. One is he did believe that he'd be politically crucified as Burns kept warning him. There is no truth to that. We know that we did let the Japanese keep the emperor after the war. There was no reaction to that. There was no resistance to that. In fact, we kept the, let them keep the emperor because it was in America's interest. Secretary of War Stimson and others knew that the only way to control Japanese troops was if the emperor was on the throne. And so it was in America's interest to let them keep the emperor. The other thing is that we didn't want them to surrender too quickly because we wanted to use the atomic bomb. In fact, Stalin went to Potsdam with his own draft of the Potsdam Declaration. But not only did the United States not accept the Soviet draft, the United States did not let Stalin sign the Potsdam Declaration because that would have given warning to the Japanese that the Soviet Union was about to come into the war. The Americans wanted to wait until the, we could drop the atomic bomb because we wanted to send that message to the Soviet Union. So I think because he, Truman did have political cover, the Washington Post had an editorial titled Fatal Phrase in which they implored Truman to clarify the surrender terms so we could speed up the end of the war. The Republican leaders in the Senate held a press conference in which they urged Truman to change the surrender terms. So I don't know who's going to politically crucify him. And there was no reaction, negative reaction to Truman letting them keep the emperor. But I think those are the two reasons why he didn't do so. Um, the next question is actually related to your second point. Um, and the question is, is it possible that they wanted to see the effect of the bomb on people, i.e. not just on, on the uh, infrastructure? Uh, yeah. We, um, let, me, let me quote Brigadier General Carter Clark. He was in charge of preparing the magic summaries, the intelligence summaries in 1945. And he said, we brought them down to an abject surrender through accelerated sinking of their merchant marine and hunger alone. And we didn't need to do it. And we knew we didn't need to do it. And they knew we knew we didn't need to do it. We used them as an experiment for two atomic bombs. So yes, we did want to see the effects of it. But even more than that, because we saw the effects in Almogordo in the test. And the test there, that blew people's minds. Before that test, Robert Oppenheimer, the scientific head of the Manhattan Project, said, I couldn't imagine any demonstration that could convince the Japanese to surrender. After having witnessed the bomb test at Almogordo, Oppenheimer changed his mind. And he said, just a test in the desert was so incredibly powerful that that itself would have convinced anybody that this was horrific beyond belief. Okay, the, uh, let's see. Um, actually, uh, I think we, the, a lot of the questions are, are variations of what, what has just been asked. So at this point, if there are questions from the floor, um, or if Rusty or Yuki have questions, please raise them using the raise hand function. Yeah, I mean, while, while students are thinking about the, the questions that, that they, uh, well, they want to, you know, um, they want to ask. Uh, uh, we read this book, um, I mean, Ron Takaki's Hiroshima, where um, uh, Takaki, uh, you know, argues that, um, part, you know, part of the reason why Truman decided to use the atomic, you know, atomic bomb was because he was an insecure uh, president. Um, you know, he, he didn't have uh, much experience um, in, um, in the political world. Uh, and, and then, then we had a chance to um, discuss if, um, if Roosevelt um, survived um, the decision that, that Roosevelt um, made um, 
would that would that be a different decision that the Truman made about um, about um, the decision to drop the epic bombs? Okay, we have we have two more questions um, at this point. Um, there's one from the chat. Can you explain the influence of racism on the dropping of the atomic bomb? And the next one after that response will be from Maxwell Clegg. Um, yeah, that's what Yuki was just getting at is um, the impact that racism has on this. Uh, and Ron Takagi's book is actually quite good on, on that. Uh, the American hatred of the Japanese was unparalleled in the history, in the annals of warfare. The American wartime propaganda about Germany clearly differentiated between the Nazi leaders who were evil and the German people who we thought were innocent victims. We referred to them as the good Germans. There was no Japanese equivalent of the good, good Japanese, of the good Germans. Uh, in fact, uh, the, there's so much to say about this. Ernie Pyle, America's leading war correspondent, was transferred from the European front to the Pacific front in February of 45. And when he got to the Pacific front, he wrote, uh, in Europe, we felt that our enemies, horrible and deadly as they were, were still people. But out here, I soon gathered that the Japanese were looked upon as something subhuman and repulsive, the way that some people feel about cockroaches or mice. Newsweek reported, never before has the nation fought a war in which our troops so hate the enemy and want to kill him. Time Magazine wrote, the ordinary unreasoning Jap is ignorant. Perhaps he is human. Nothing indicates it. The British Embassy wrote back to London and the British Embassy in Washington, D.C., talking about the desire. Americans consider the Japanese vermin, and they talk about exterminating the vermin. I could go on and on with America's racism. We could talk about the internment camps. But I think I want to give, quote, Harry Truman. And instead of the N-word, I'll just say N for the purpose of this quote. Uh, and this is a letter that Truman wrote to his wife, Bess, in which he's proposing marriage to her. And he says in this letter, I think one man is as good as another, so long as he's honest and decent and not an N or a Chinaman. Uncle Will says the Lord made a white man of dust, an N from mud, and threw up what was left and it came down a Chinaman. He does hate Chinese and Japs, so do I. It's race prejudice, I guess. Um, so, there was American racism toward the Japanese. We didn't put the Italians or the Germans in concentration camps. We only put the Jap 120,000 Japanese, even though even J. Edgar Hoover, that paragon of, of <laughs> bigotry, uh, said there was all J Japanese had already been taken care of. There was no threat. We still put them in in the, what was called at the time, concentration camps. Initially, they were allowed to migrate elsewhere outside of uh, California, Oregon, and Washington. But as the governor of Idaho says, we don't want them. The Japs, he says, look like rats, think like rats, and breed like rats. We don't want them. And that was the attitude that all the Western governors had. So there's reason, besides simple racism, for why there was so much hatred toward the Japanese, Pearl Harbor, the Bataan Death March, and a lot of other things, but uh, racism plays a major factor. Now, would we have dropped the bomb on the Germans? I often get asked that, and I think that we likely would have. You have to remember that we began the bomb project after the Germans split the uranium atom in late 1938. The Americans learned of this in early 1939. And then after Einstein wrote his first letter to President Roosevelt urging the US to begin the bomb project, it was the European emigre scientists who were concerned, not the Americans, a scientists or military. And their fear was what would happen if Hitler got a bomb. So they convinced Roosevelt to start the bomb project as a deterrent against a German bomb. It was never thought of that the Japanese would get the bomb. But as early as May 5th, 1943, we decided that 
the plane that was going to drop the bombs was the B-29 Super Fortress, which was only used in the Pacific War. And so from that point on, the target was going to be Japan. Would we have used it against the Germans if the bomb was ready in time? Perhaps. But it was a lot easier to use it against an enemy who we hated so strongly. Um, we have a, a question from Maxwell. Max, could you uh, unmute yourself? And then we have a question from Carolyn from Rusty Eisenberg. Thank you. And uh, thank you for coming, Dr. Kosnick. It's been very interesting to listen to what you have to say. Um, the one question I have is, what is your reasoning for believing we are closer than 100 seconds to midnight? Well, that was the determination in January of, I think it was January 2019. It was early 2019. Since then, U.S. relations with both Russia and China have actually deteriorated. When I look at the U.S. freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea, when I look at the U.S. freedom of op navigation operations in the Strait of Taiwan, when I look at the U.S. Uh, planes, nuclear capable planes that are flying through the Strait of Taiwan, that are flying over Chinese exercises in the South China Sea, that are flying right near uh, Kaliningrad, the Soviet territory between Poland and Lithuania, the U.S. is escalating its provocations now at the same time that the Chinese and the Russians are also both um, intensifying their operations. So we've got massive war games going on. We've got a situation like the one in Armenia, between uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia now. Uh, and and what, what could that lead to? On the side of Azerbaijan, you've got Israel provides 60% of its weapons. We've got uh, Japan, we've, we've got uh, the United States uh, on the one side. On the other side, we've got uh, Russia, we've got Iran. I mean, we've got these situations that could easily deteriorate. And, and, and the thing that one point I haven't talked about is the danger of nuclear winter. Um, in the 1980s, Carl Sagan and his associates warned about nuclear winter. And then it got written off as junk science by the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. It's not junk science. In fact, the recent studies show that they actually underestimated the threat of nuclear winter. The latest studies by the scientists show that even a limited nuclear war between India and Pakistan in which 100 Hiroshima-sized nuclear weapons were used, what would happen would be that they would, the cities would burn, 5 million tons of smoke, soot, and debris would shoot into the stratosphere, within two weeks circle the stratosphere, block the sun's rays from hitting the earth, temperatures on the earth's surface would plummet to freezing, and much of the earth's agricultural supply would be, be curtailed. That limited nuclear war between India and Pakistan with 100 Hiroshima-sized nuclear weapons could kill up to 2 billion people around the world. We don't have 100. We've got 14,000 nuclear weapons. And they're not Hiroshima-sized. They're between 7 and 80 times as powerful as the Hiroshima bomb. So that's the reality we face. And that's India and Pakistan. They're always on the verge of war. They bombed each other last year. Fortunately, cooler heads prevailed and they didn't go to war, but that could happen. We've got India and China now threatening each other and, for, and conflicting there in the Himalayas. We've got so many situations that are more dangerous. It was March 1st, 2018, when Vladimir Putin made his State of the Nation address. And there he announced that Russia now had five new nuclear weapons, all of which could circumvent American missile defense. Since then, Trump's nuclear posture review of March, uh, February 2018, now an announced that the US was developing two new nuclear weapons, one of which has already been deployed. And that's a, a smaller nuke on submarines. The point of smaller nukes, according to Trump, is that they're more usable. Trump has said, I don't fear an arms race, I welcome one. And Trump's new nuclear negotiator, Billingsley, has also said, we can outspend them and uh, into the ground on this. And so, so and we've got one, we've dismantled the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, the INF treaty, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, the Open Skies Treaty, 
the only part of the nuclear architecture that remains, the arms control architecture, is the New START Treaty. That expires in February 2021. Trump has not renewed it, despite Putin's pleas to renew it. Biden has said he'll renew it. Hopefully he'll be in there in time to do so. Because once that goes, then we're back to the crazy kind of arms race we had in the 1960s and 1980s. When I used to go to Hiroshima, when I, every year I'd find myself writing down the same information because it was so mind boggling. And that was by 1985, this is the Atomic Bomb Museum in Hiroshima, said that by 1985, the world had accumulated the equivalent of 1.47 million Hiroshima bombs. How many times do we have to be able to kill everybody on the planet before we're satisfied? In fact, Project Sundial, which most people don't know anything about, in 1954, scientists testified before congressional hearings about the feasibility of developing a hydrogen bomb that would be 700,000 times as powerful as the Hiroshima bomb. A single bomb 700,000 times as powerful as the Hiroshima bomb. And we knew we were going in this direction. Oppenheimer briefed the members of the interim committee on May 31st, 1945, all the top leaders, military and political, and says there that within three years, the United States is likely to have weapons between 700 and 7,000 times as powerful as the Hiroshima bomb. We knew where we were going with this, which is the insanity of dropping those bombs and opening the world to what the scientists warned in 45 was gonna be an uncontrollable arms race. Thank you. We have time for three more questions. We have uh, Rusty, Professor Eisenberg, and then Rachel, and then a question about the study tour. So uh, Professor Eisenberg. Oh, you're on, okay. okay. Thank you, Peter, for this talk, and thank you for cramming in 16 hours worth of talks into a very short amount of time. Um, I just have a number of questions, but, you know, you went very quickly over the fact that these arms control agreements have been scrapped. And, and of course, this is a very complicated subject that doesn't lend itself to, you know, easy explanation. But I do actually think it would be worth just taking a couple of minutes to say something more about these arms control agreements that have now been scrapped. And just to contextualize it, I'm wondering about your thoughts, but you know, I think one thing that has happened is because the Democrats have been pushing so hard on, um, on the president, um, you know, about his connection to Putin, they've actually probably been much more silent than they normally would have been as this whole arms control structure has just been torn apart. Um, so my question really is, could you say a little bit more by way of explanation of what we're talking about with the arms control agreement? And then the final question really is, you know, what are regular peace people supposed to do about this, right? I think one problem about this nuclear subject is it makes people feel instantly powerless. And we feel powerless about many things right now. Um, you know, it's easy to feel powerless about a whole lot of things. But the nuclear subject in particular, somebody, I'm not sure where that's coming from. Somebody needs to mute. I can't. Okay, let's start that one again. So I mean, I'm really asking a double question, which is, you know, could you say a little bit more by way of explanation about this whole structure of arms control agreements that have been torn apart? Um, and then following on to that is what does that do for people who are not, you know, experts in this field? You know, what, what options, what space does that create for activity of any kind? Good questions. Um, you say we have another hour and a half that we can discuss <laughs> this? Um, the arms control agreements. And as you put it in an interesting context by talking about the demonization of Putin and how that's created a toxic environment in the United States for, for thinking about uh, arms control agreements. But these make no sense, even from a national, an American national self-interest perspective. The JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal, which was negotiated with a lot of help from Russia especially, but others also, 
was working. It was working brilliantly. Iran had shipped off 90, more than 97% of its enriched nuclear fuel. Iran had mothballed most of its centrifuges. Iran was complying, according to the UN, uh, Iran was complying with every aspect of this, and the US abrogated it. Trump, in his usual idiocy, said, I can get a better deal. Well, of course, we have uh, no deal at all now, and now Iran is increasing its supply of enriched uranium. Uh, now, since the deal has been abrogated, and the Europeans were furious about that. Uh, in terms of the um, New START Treaty, for example, or the current need for a nuclear arms agreement, we've had nuclear arms agreements in this country going back to 1963 with the Partial Arms Control Treaty, the Partial Test Ban Treaty that Kennedy negotiated. And according to Sorensen, Sorensen said that the mo Kennedy's proudest achievement as president was the arms control deal with Soviet Union. Uh, it was also a proud moment for Khrushchev. Uh, and then since then, we've had the SALT treaties and had other treaties. But with this new START treaty uh, now, and again, let me, let me talk about this context about demonization of Putin and how it's poisoned the atmosphere even more. Uh, I think that there are a lot of things going on. I've been to Russia a lot of times. I get invited there. And when I was going there during the campaign, almost every, almost all my Russian friends and American experts were, who were going there were supporting Trump. And I asked one of my R Russian friends who's a top, former head of the lower house of the Duma and currently in the Senate, what was a likely candidate to replace Putin if he decided not to run again for re-election. And I asked him, why did you and so many others support Trump? You know, who's this reckless person, the last person you'd want to have in, in, in there? And he said, Peter, for one reason and one reason only, he said he wanted to be friends with Russia. Uh, now, I'm very critical about a lot of things in Russia. I'm very critical about Russian interference in US elections. I'm very critical about the lack of democracy in Russia, the crackdown on, on, on dissidents in Russia. But the, the, the world needs arms control agreements. And when Trump says he's not going to negotiate unless China joins in also, which is an excuse for pulling out of the INF Treaty, that's an excuse for, pull, for not renewing the New START Treaty, China has right now about 200 nuclear weapons. The US has more than 6,000. Russia has more than 6,000. The US and Russia have 93% of the world's nuclear weapons between us. China has 200. And China has a lot of missiles maybe, but they are not about to threaten the United States. In fact, they don't even have a first strike doctrine. So they have policies that they wouldn't act unless they were attacked first. So to include China is just a way to undermine, to undercut the treaty. Uh, so even though there are a lot of things that I'm very critical of, and I, I do an insane amount of interviews on Russian TV. I probably do 100 Russian TV interviews a year. Uh, and, uh, and what I say, my message repeatedly, is that it's absolutely incumbent upon the US and the Soviets to act together to eliminate these threats. Putin has shown a willingness to do so. The US, you know, we have got to get back to the to NATO expansion and what that means to, to Russia and why it makes them feel so threatened. So a lot of things that both sides need to do. I don't think that Biden is going to do a lot of things that are necessary or the Democrats are, but I think they can be pressured much more into acting reasonably than the uh, than the Trump administration, certainly. Uh, so long-winded answer to your first question. I'll give a short-winded answer to the second one. And that is that the students, my students, your students, are very concerned and knowledgeable when it comes to climate change, when it comes to global warming. They're mobilized, they're active, they're passionate. I mean, I admire that. I love that about the, this younger generation because that does pose an existential threat to their, to their lives. 
but the immediate existential threat, which they tend to be ignoring, is the nuclear threat. I mean, climate change is real. We're feeling it now. We feel it all over the planet. But the nuclear threat is the one long before climate change has a chance to wipe us out. Nuclear weapons have an opportunity to wipe us out. And I think that we, should, we are capable, unlike Trump, who maybe can't focus on two things at once, your students are capable of focusing on two things at once. And I think that we have to begin because it's only that pressure that's going to force Biden and Harris and the Democrats to act responsibly on this matter. I think Biden will renew the New START Treaty. And for that reason alone, everybody's got to vote for him. That, if nothing else, then that would be sufficient grounds to vote for him. But I think he's capable of doing a lot better than that. And he's like, on occasion said very encouraging things in that regard. But overall, if you look at his foreign policy advisors, they're rotten to the core, in my opinion. They're the old, they're, they're hawks for the most part. They're neoliberals and with neoconservative policies, they tend to support American empire. And um, so I don't think that without a lot of outside pressure, they're going to do the things that I would like to see them do. Thanks. Patricia, I can't hear you. Pat, you have to unmute. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, we, we are a little bit over time. Do you have time for two, the two last questions? I've got time, sure. Okay, so um, uh, the first question is from Rachel, and I will ask her to unmute herself to ask the question. And then the second question just asks for a little more information about your study program. Rachel, go ahead. You still here? Yes. Um, okay. My question is, so like right now, there is like, uh, a, I guess, our war against China as like the United States, a trade war, and more of like a competition of who's powerful. So my question is, like, how, in terms of like, what I'm trying to say is like, the United States has like, uh, become friends with India, in order to kind of suppress China's imperialism in East Asia. Do you have like comments on that? That is my question. About the US alliance with India. Yes. Well, I've been lucky enough to do three speaking tours in India in the past two years. So I've gotten to travel all over India to talk about these kinds of questions. And India, as you know, since 1998 is a nuclear power. They actually tested their bomb back in 1974, I think it was, but they didn't develop, weaponize it till 1998. And uh, under Modi, Modi is best friends with Obama. You know, remember the Howdy Modi tour in Houston. Uh, and Modi to me is a very dangerous Hindu nationalist with extreme right wing views uh, who poses a, a serious threat. And so the US has been cultivating India and was trying for a long time. India maintained a certain kind of neutrality throughout the uh, throughout the Cold War and afterwards. And it was actually Nehru, Prime Minister Nehru, who led the third world anti-nuclear movement at times. And Nehru, after the US testing in the 1950s, the atmospheric testing, Nehru said, America's leaders are self-centered lunatics who will blow up anybody who gets in their way. So India was actually exemplary for a long time. And they hearkened back to Gandhi and Nehru and those traditions. Uh, but un in recent, like so many other parts of the world, India has turned to the right. And it's very distressing to see. And now they're playing along with the United States in its global efforts. Um, I, you know, I, I was very disappointed. Well, I, my first trip to India, I'll tell you a quick story, I was I didn't get into the country because there was a confusion with my passport. So I had to go to Nepal for the first few, few days till my new passport came through. And then I went back to India, but I was supposed to meet with uh, uh, 
uh, Gandhi, uh, the head of the Congress party. And he had come to hear me talk in New Delhi uh, and we were gonna have a private meeting afterwards. And, uh, but I wasn't there to, to meet with him. But I have a lot of other friends in the Congress party and who are active in India. And there is a strong movement. Uh, and now maybe the sad spread of coronavirus in India uh, which is going to be maybe even surpass the United States at some point before too long. Uh, and I knew that that was going to be the case. Maybe that will undermine some of this support for, uh, for Modi and his Hindu nationalist policies, because I would love to see India play a different role. India, as you know, right now, India has got 1.3 billion people and China has 1.4 billion. But the trajectory is that India will soon surpass China and become the biggest, most populous country in the world. India is absolutely crucial to the future of uh, this planet. So uh, having India play a positive role is, is essential. Thank you. And now my Japan trip. Just a little bit, yes. I think people would be very interested to hear a little bit about that. Uh, well, it's actually a three credit course. We began it back in 1995. And that's when I started my Nuclear Studies Institute. And that summer, one of my students, uh, uh, you, uh, Professor Terazawa was talking about her experience with Nagasaki. One of my former students grew up in Hiroshima. Her mother and grandmother had survived the bombings and her grandfather had been killed in the bombing. And she and I decided we were gonna do something special to commemorate the 50th anniversary. So in addition to teaching courses on campus, we were going to have students bring students over to Hiroshima that summer in Kyoto. And while uh, she, Akiko was over there planning the trip, the Enola Gay exhibit at the Smithsonian was canceled. So the leaders in Hiroshima and Nagasaki asked if we could bring some of the artifacts that were supposed to go to the Smithsonian to American University to do an exhibit. It was the first time that Hiroshima and Nagasaki had ever done an exhibit outside of Japan. And so it was a big exhibit and they launched my Nuclear Studies Institute. We did the trip there and they treated us so nicely and it was so exciting that we decided we were gonna keep doing it. And so we've been doing it every summer since except this past one. And what we do is we travel with Japanese students and professors. We talk about the history of the Pacific War, Japanese atrocities, as well, but most of the focus is on the atomic bombings. Now we go to Tokyo, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki, and uh, we go to the commemorative events we, in, the, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We go to private uh, high school commemorative events or an elementary school commemorative event in Nagasaki, a school in which all the students were killed. We travel with one of the atomic bomb survivors. Some of you have read John Hersey's book, Hiroshima which the uh, NYU School of Journalism uh, identified as the most important work of journalism in the 20th century, uh, Hersey's book, Hiroshima. It profiles six survivors, it's written in 46. And one of the survivors is the Reverend Kiyoshi Tanamoto. Well, his daughter, who graduated from American University and lives outside of Hiroshima, travels with my students the entire time we're there. She was eight months old at the time of the bombing and is a very, very powerful witness to a lot of what's happened. Uh, so we, we spent a lot of time with the atomic bomb survivors. We go to museums and art galleries and uh, just, it's an incredibly powerful experience. My students always say that it's a life-changing experience and it really is a life-changing, it certainly changed my life because up to that point, I was writing more about scientists and politics and other things. And after that, I devoted most of my research after my first trip there to nuclear issues and nuclear history. So it was life-changing for me. I know it's life-changing for my students. Uh, so anybody who would like to join, we also now bring uh, a dozen students with us from the George School, private school in, outside of Philadelphia, high school seniors, uh, but we bring students from universities all over the country, and it's not limited to students. We have retirees who come with retirees who come with us, and professors. So it's open to everybody, and uh, truly an amazing experience. 
Thank you very much, Professor Kuznick. This has been a, an enlightening uh, talk. Uh, thank you so much for coming to Hofstra virtually. Um, I wish that you had been able to come in real, in real place, um, but this has been wonderful. Uh, Yuki or Rusty, would you like to say some closing words? No, I just wanted to. Thank you very much. Thank you all for listening. Bye.